folks, this is Stephanie in The Secret Place. So glad you're with me today. I am back with Merton today. We just finished, my friends and I just finished an eight week um, book discussion uh, at our home on uh, this book, The Inner Experience by Thomas Merton, which I've talked to you about before here in The Secret Place, but it's so rich. I mean, we only got through, in eight weeks, we only got through four chapters because the conversation was so meaty and unpacking and all these layers there. So there's a little part here that I thought that you might enjoy um, that I wanted to share with you. And it has to do with um, just this idea of, of what is contemplation. Uh, and not that we could take the mystery out of it because there is mystery involved in, in a quiet place of just sitting before the Lord. But um, some, some people have asked me, well, what what is contemplation? In fact, a young lady asked me this week, if you had to say one thing, I know it's many things, but if you had to say one thing, what would you say contemplation is? And I thought about that for a minute and I said, hmm, hmm, I think contemplation is the sustained gaze at the one for whom our hearts truly long. It's a sustained gaze. It's, um, the desire to just be with and look upon that one that you love, uh, the one that loves you without an agenda, without a plan, um, without a set amount of time. And here's what Merton says about it. He says, when the eye is clear and single, that is to say disinterested, having only one intention, then it can see things as they are. The, con the contemplative at this stage is one whose thoughts are no longer passionate and no longer distorted. They are simple and direct. He sees straight into the nature of things as they are. At the same time, he sees into his own nature. And this is a, this is a mystical grace of God. Oh my goodness. I just love that. I love that because it is a grace of God. And I want to... I want to unpack that just for a minute because it can seem a little bit confusing to say the contemplative. You might think, well, you're truly giving your, yourself over to that sustained gaze um, toward the Lord, um, that things would get better and you'd feel more whole and centered and, and, and you know, more passionate and energetic about life and about purpose. But Merton is here saying, he goes, the stage, um, the contemplative gets to a point where their own thoughts are no longer even passionate or um, uh, they're, they're kind of like disinterested even in their own thoughts. And you think, how could that be? That just seems weird. But no, it's like, it's like a removal of the importance or the seriousness. You know, the, the, the adage, don't take yourself so seriously. Um, I, that used to befuddle me too when I was much younger. Like, well, of course we have to take each other, ourselves so seriously. Look at what happens if we don't. If we just take it ourselves trifling and silly and uh, irresponsibly, you know, we can't do that. But but there's another side of it, and that's that side that we we often do take our own thoughts and our own ideas and our own dreams and desires so seriously that we let them rule us. And that's what Merton means when he says, like, the passion. Um, it's not like there's no enthusiasm at all, but like that suffering passion gets taken away. And we just, um, uh, the, the contemplative can get to a place where um, then life and circumstances are not distorted. Because think about it. Our passions in so many ways distort the truth, right? Right. I mean, you you know, passion, the root there, like think about the passion of the Christ, the root of the word passion is 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 suffering. There's a sense of pain and suffering in passion. And uh, when you say you have passion for another person, even a spouse, someone that you're married to and you have, you're so passionate for each other and with each other, that, I mean, that's good, clearly. Obviously, you want to have that kind of passion. But when you have that kind of passion, you know that there's also suffering involved. In fact, there's a whole bunch of people that I know over my life who have not gotten married or not wanted to commit to a special one special person because they don't ever want to put themselves in the position of having that kind of suffering or pain. It's attached. Both, both are part of it. Great, great love, deep, deep love and, and desire and deep, deep pain and suffering. 
you know. And that pain and that suffering can distort the way we see reality. It can distort our sense of self. It can, you know, the, the way that we see ourselves, the way that we see others. I mean, that just happened to me this morning. It's just a never ending. It's the song that never ends. Here I am at this um, later stage in my adult life. And I'm still, I still struggle regularly with, with my passions, with passions like, uh, and those passions uh, distort how I view myself or the world. Some days I'm, I'm so positive so many days, but some days I wake up and I just feel so negative and dark, you know, and it's uh, uh, undoubtedly because I've let my passions run away with me. Passion, of course, do, do not be thinking I'm saying passion is only sexual. No, I'm talking about the passions and desires for other things, like good things, like the, again, justice in the world bringing justice to, to the world, truth, for truth to prevail, for, um, uh, for you know, the, the globe to get along, for wars to cease, for, um, for young people to grow strong into strong, uh, loving, caring citizens who care about their communities, their local uh, neighborhoods. There are so many things I'm passionate about, and those passions sometimes get away from me, and someone does something or says something, or ignores something that goes against my passion, and I just inwardly like, oh, they must have done it because of this or that. But there is no one exempt. I do it, you do it, we all do it. And I think that the the quiet place that we can go to, um, where we're at, at that place of, uh, of contemplation, as Merton is talking about in this little book, um, is, is the thing that really, um, helps us detach. Now, again, here's something more. I'm not talking about detaching like the Zen Buddhists get all into like this empty myself and I'm detached from caring about anything. Now, I got to be careful with the vocabulary here because that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about Christian prayer and waiting on the Lord God. So um, think about that. Um, maybe ruminate over um, the words I spoke earlier when I said what occurred to me about contemplation is that it's, I jotted it down here because I just came up with it yesterday, um, a sustained gaze at the one for whom our hearts truly long. Contemplation. What does your heart truly long for? Can you answer that? What does your heart truly long for? It's worth waiting in the Lord and waiting on the Lord in silence and prayer and contemplative prayer for the Lord to show up, to help us walk in the newness of life and the freshness of what he has put in our hearts. So just a little word for you today, thinking of you and hoping that as we get closer to this new year, can't believe 2022, that we will all be um, a little closer, a little more confident in the Lord, a little closer to Him, and caring for each other and those around us. Um, you take care and have a wonderful evening, a wonderful weekend. Have a great day. Bye-bye now. <music>